We have now launched the online Shockwave course. When I set the company up, which is over 12 years ago now, which is hard to believe, I was always about educating the clinicians as well, not just in terms of the technology. So when Dom Smith came to me with this idea of doing the Shockwave course, I was all for it. And Dom and Katie have done a fantastic job of putting it together. It's really impressive, really comprehensive. It is technology agnostic. So whatever system you're using will be able to help you with this. So it's a brilliant piece of work. The guys have done really well. So check it out and go to the link below and let us know what you think. Hello, welcome. Today I am joined by Liam Rogers, who's a physiotherapist and also founder of Inspire Physio and Fitness. So firstly, Liam, welcome. Thank you for joining. Cheers, buddy. Thank you for having me. Great to, great to be on board. Yeah, no, I am very disappointed because I normally see you with your, your ripped body out in tiny, tiny <laughs> pants. <laughs> so um, this is going to be maybe maybe slightly more professional, but we'll we'll see. I don't know. I, I like both both versions anyway. Agreed. Yeah. No. There's definitely uh, two versions. There's a professional, you know, polo shirts on, classic Aussie physio uniform, and then there's the yeah the budget smuggling um, side. So you get the professional side today, buddy. Unfortunately. Well, yeah. We'll see. We'll see how we can how we can get on with that. Getting a bit of a uh, bit bit of both characters. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try my best for you. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so it's, you've got a really interesting background and uh, I'm really keen to, to find out a bit more about that. So so where are you from originally? Um, originally from a little country town called Gracemere in central Queensland. So it's about an hour's flight or eight hour drive north of Brisbane up that Queensland coastline. Um, literally middle of nowhere, town of 4,000 people. There was no high school or anything. So very much like the equivalent of a kind of English village um, is, yeah, literally where I'm from. So uh, to be living in central London these days is very, very different. So, yes, yeah, so I'm trying to think back to my completely classic UK person in Australia. And, you know, you do, you do the usual suspects. So is that like Cape Tribulation? How far away is it from, from that sort of area? Well, it'd be halfway between the Cape and Brisbane. If that, if that, probably even less. Um, you've got to remember, Europe can fit inside Australia. So from like eight hour drive from Brisbane to me, it's another 12 hour drive to get to Cairns. And then it's another 12 hour drive to get to the tip of the Cape. So <laughs> I'm probably a third of the way up of the state. It's mental. Yeah, it's mental. I'm going to stop with the geography because yeah, it really, it really is mental with that now. Um, but is that like, uh, what about like Early Beach and Fraser Island, that was so, it. So, yeah, it's about four hours away from Early. So in terms of landmarks, that would be the closest. Um, a lot of people will drive through the, the town like where I went to high school called Rockhampton, um, and they remember us just because there's a bull statues everywhere. Um, so as you come into the into the city, there's a big old Brahmin bull with Welcome to Rockhampton, and everyone kind of drives through there and, and feels like they're in Texas. <laughs> It's amazing. I, I loved driving around Australia because it's so random, isn't it? It's like you just got absolute vastness of nothing. Like we actually yeah. ran out of fuel one time and it was a little bit little bit scary. But no, no, it's amazing. So what was it like growing up in, in a town like that? Um, it was great, to be honest. Um, the level of freedom and everything that we had was incredible. So um, I lived on the same block as the pool. I was a swimmer, so I would walk there. I would just cycle across the town to athletics training where the other school was. We'd walk back and forth to school. You could just walk down the road to your mate's house, kind of leave bikes in the front yard and um, very much like a, a really friendly little small community. So, yeah, no, it was a really, really great childhood. And so what, what, what prompted you to start looking into the world that you've got into now of physio? Um, so it all actually came from my student coach. So when you were in grade 10 at my school, you had to do a uh, work placement. Um, and he basically was like, oh, why don't you try physio? So I was really quite sporty. Dad wanted me to be a P teacher because that mean I could stay at, and do it at the local uni. Um, I really didn't want to do that and be with the kids. And then so went into the physio placement because one of the girls who I swam with her mum was also a physio in town. So I basically just got to go in and just hang out with Sally for a week. And basically from there, it was like, didn't fully understand what I was getting myself into, but basically just said, oh yeah, I'll be a physio. 
and and that was it from the chose the grades or the subjects that I needed to in senior um applied after school and everything and basically went in from there so thank you to the swim coach yeah, and like people talk about Australian physios. I was actually on a call with someone this morning. It's like, oh, well, yeah, Aussies just get this. And that's a bit in terms of like strengthening, exercise, rehab, that sort of thing. So you guys have got like a real um, association and respect within a certain type of rehab and, and physio. Like, do you, if you noticed anything from being in the UK more, like well, what do you see the differences being between them, if, 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 if there are any? Yeah. Uh... And like the broad demographic, it, to me, it's actually a huge, huge divide between like a, well, just the level of training I think that we get, but also the type of personality that goes into the programs. Um, so at home, yeah, as you said, like we're all very sporty. Physio in itself as a profession is so well respected and out of all the allied health is probably the most superior. There's more of us where pretty much everyone you know has a physio. Like, it's just one of those common things. You have your dentist, you have your GP, you have your physio. That's like a very, very commonplace thing to have. Um, chiropractors and osteopaths are nowhere near as popular and, and there's not as many of them. Um, you can literally find a physio clinic, nearly as many as like pubs you can find in the UK. They're absolutely everywhere at home. Um, but just in terms of the quality, so for my university, it was an OP2. And so basically nearly the equivalent of the grades you needed to get into medicine. So you needed 96% on your final exams to get into physio. So that was the demand like and how hard it was to actually get in. And then even in my program, if I think through the level of sport that people were in there, like um, I was a national swimmer, there was another national swimmer, there was a national netball player, a number of guys who had competed at like state level for rugby, all the different codes, pretty much every single person went into it with a high pedigree of athletic background. And there was a couple of people who wanted to say, go into peds or something who weren't in the sports side of it. But when you've got that many people in the program who were so athletic, the MSK like learning that we did was really superior in my opinion. So, um, the training that we got there, you know, there was four individual subjects for MSK alone, um, plus a massage subject, plus a hands-on subject. So realistically six um, that we did across three of the years before you even go into your final year, which was full just prac placement. Um, so yeah, the level of quality that we have there is high. Um, and then as I said, just we're so athletic that most of us have done injuries ourselves. And then so I know for most of my staff that I even have here, like part of the reason we got into physio was we were injured, <laughs> which derailed our dreams of becoming a professional athlete. And then we realized that we could actually help people get to their goals. And that seemed like actually a pretty cool job opportunity. And then so that's one of the ways that we get into physio as well. That's a really common pathway in Australia. We just failed sporting stars. Yeah, no, I think it's really interesting with the dynamic because it's like in the UK, it is so NHS dominated or it has been. I think that is shifting. And I think a lot of it is shifting more to the model that you're talking about, where physios, sports rehabbers, they're becoming more prominent on the streets and like you can see more clinics and so on. There seems to be a big opportunity in that. So what is the pathway normally then for a physio in Australia? So what is it? What is the main job or what the main opportunities for you where you tend to go and work? Yeah, so upon graduation, there's literally just two routes that you go down to. So um, you can either go into the government health schemes or the private hospitals, um, or you go straight into private practice. It's similar to here, but everywhere has new grad programs. So if you're going into a government scheme, um, you will literally put on the same sort of rotations you would be in like the NHS hospitals. So that is relatively similar. Um, but again, across that program, you've got a lot of supervision time, one-on-one -on -one training with people, mentorship, those things. But I guess the big difference that probably relates to us and where we're all practicing now is the new grad program in private practice. And that's what I don't really see happening here. And especially when you've got some of the insurance companies that won't cover new grads, you have to have one or two years worth of training under your belt before you can register with the insurance programs. Um, the big practices at home will take on a bunch of new grads 
Um, and then again, that is the exact same thing in terms of the supervision. So you have one-on-one -on -one mentorship on a weekly capacity. You have like big group CPDs. Um, so my mentors for the first two years um, of training, the owner of my company was the director of sports medicine in Australia. He wrote the program. Um, my direct mentor was then also the ex physio for Sunderland. So the people that I'm learning off alike have come from professional sport and in there, and I was literally trained beside them the whole way through from the first day out. Um, that to me seems to be one of the biggest gaps in the market and the differences between it is that kind of those foundational one or two years out of the program. We can, one, we need to change the insurance policy here so I can actually see insurance patients, but get some of these big practices and get some of these new grad programs actually happening so we can really kickstart that private practice pathway for British trained physios. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. So in terms of like yeah, you getting paid in that period, like is that on a different salary? Like how do they how do they afford to pay to have someone that's kind of really learning on the job on it? Like how does that dynamic work? Well, I guess we still have, because the profession itself is so big there, you're still seeing quite a number of patients. And then so the equivalent salary, like I started on 60K in, in Australian dollars, so 30,000 pounds. So you're on an okay wage. You're basically from the business side, I'm guessing making the bare minimum, like just breaking even while they train you up in that capacity. But the goal is if they train you good enough, you the, most of the time will actually stay with that clinic for a number of years. So if you then have that employee for another five years and you then get to make your huge surplus on top of it, it it's more of that long game of getting good trained physios into your program. Um, that's probably where it's from. Yeah. 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 I mean, I definitely agree. I think there's, it, there's a big opportunity within that private healthcare space here, but it's then a lot of companies aren't quite ready to, to know how to expand it's still in a bit of a, a funny funny dynamic because the nhs has been so dominant whereas now it's it's really not not able to to cope with that so there's opportunities it's still trying to find its feet isn't there in terms of how do we upskill these people that are coming out straight from university that like you said would really benefit from having a year two years more in terms of mentorship and support yeah, no, I completely agree with you. I think that's a big challenge for the CSP at the moment, um, and even the NHS, like, uh, and universities. In my opinion, they do need to increase the level of MSK training and provision that they are doing if they want these people to be successful in private practice in the future. Because I know across central London, it is not a hidden fact that Australian, Kiwi, and even South African physios, in some respect, can dominate the fields here like we get hired extremely easily because the level of training that we have which is such a shame for british physios and physio community um we want to make sure that homegrown trained talent is actually having the ability to get up into some of these top tier jobs in the central big cities if they want to but the programming uh, is kind of letting them down yeah yeah there's a lot of definitely a lot of aussies and kiwis there which you know i, I like as well it's good <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, I enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, like talking about your swimming, then. So, Aussie swimming, I mean, it was amazing. Like, the Olympics is always class, isn't it? I know you, you were over there, weren't you, for, for, for a period of time. Um, yeah. But, Aussie swimming, amazing. You guys absolutely smashed performance everywhere. So, well done, well done on that. But, like, for, for you competing then in that, that must have been to, to be a national champion, that's, uh, or to be involved in that sort of level of things, that's, that's really impressive. So, what was the, the the competitive vibe like in 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 that for you? Um, as you said, like the Australian swim team is insane and has been for quite a long time. It's easily one of our biggest sports, and where I'm from, Queensland, we are easily the dominant state when it comes to swimming as well. So the four girls and the four by one all train in Queensland, like in Brisbane, at the same club, <laughs> which is just insanely impressive. Um, so. Basically from age nine is when I went into the senior squad. Um, so I was training with the teenagers all the way up to 17 years old. And so it would be an hour and a half in the water in the morning and then two hours in the water of an evening plus half hour of dry lead before you even got in the water. So that was pretty much every day. We would compete on Wednesday nights, a club night, and then on weekend you'd have competitions. And 
yeah, like the, the level of competition, it's, it's up there. It's really high. And then so basically from that young age, you know, every second weekend we're driving around the countryside to different swim meets and stuff. Um, but it really, it teaches you a lot. Like I'm, I'm glad I got to do it. Like I'm definitely a competitive person. Um, so I think to be able to, you know, very grateful to my parents to have those opportunities to go around to, yeah, qualify for state, um, qualify for nationals, but swimming, I guess, wasn't my only sport. So that's what made it a bit quite tough because I had to, I also went to state for athletics and water polo. <laughs> um, and then, so I got to a point where my parents were basically like, you need to choose. And then, so a lot of the times actually, instead of going to national, then yes, yeah, so I wasn't champion, I qualified and would go, but would actually then choose to go to states in athletics as well. Um, just because that was a bit bit more fun competition, didn't have to travel as far, timing-wise, it was better. Um, but yeah, competing across a, a range of sports as well meant that my week when I was at school was relatively insane in terms of timing-wise, the level of training that I was doing. Um, I look back at it now and easily it was just the fittest of my life and <laughs> missed those days. <laughs> How easy it was for me to pump out like a 5K time trial. That, that was easy that would just be a tuesday night call off you going yeah yeah no swimming is just hard isn't it like running's hard swimming's really hard it's like that is it's a really really taxing taxing thing and how helpful has it been to think in your development and your personality and everything coming from such a competitive environment um it, it, it's really helpful like in some way but then in other ways, it's probably not the best. Like when you want to be collaborative with people and work in that team environment, which we do with the NDT or um, sometimes can get a little bit too competitive where I'm like, I need to win. I need to win this. I need to build this. Um, but then it's actually, we make it into fun games, like with that competitive nature, like with my employees. And it's like, oh, well, I'm beating you this month. Like I build more than you. And we make those little competition because I think that is one aspect that we all start to miss. Like once you retire and you come out, it's like I just that thrill of competing with people. <laughs> it, it's still in there. It's just finding different avenues to try and pursue that. Um, but yeah, there's definitely pros and cons of how it comes into your kind of work life. And I guess it's just trying to balance that and just make sure that those cons, you're not getting too competitive with people and you're actually being able to step back and bring up the rest of your team with you and actually be like a proper, proper leader of that, um, of your team and your colleagues um, versus just trying to, I guess, dominate it and be that. Because they've seen it in, you know, some practices where you've got an individual where they're not willing to share their clients. So they're going away for a week and they're like, oh no, like that's mine. Like, and they're being competitive because they, they want that billing. It's their person, not willing to share ideas or collaborate with other people or, you know, help them out. And I think that's actually, quite a shame where they've just gone too far down that track. Um, we all know that a collaborative approach to, you know, healthcare or any kind of care is going to be the best thing that we can do for our patients. So it's just taking that that ego out of it and being able to step back and admit if you don't really know something and, and ask for help when you can. So pretty grateful that I recognise that really early on and haven't really struggled in that capacity. Yeah, but no, it's def definitely an important trait. But like, where do you sit as well coming from Australia where it's super competitive? Because there's all there's this um, discussions around sales in healthcare and like you're in private practice and there's more growth in that space. But a lot of it is NHS centric or has been. And I feel like the culture has been really dominated by that. So when people talk about sales or generating business, like, how, how do you see the culture within the acceptance that you know, everyone's selling something to some extent, but in healthcare, it can sometimes feel like it's a little bit inappropriate to be seen to be selling something. Um, yeah, I can't agree with you that yeah, sometimes it can be seen inappropriate, and I'd, I'd probably sit on that fence. Uh, um, again, there's pros and cons. So you need to be selling in some capacity to make a business and make sure you've got clients coming in and doing things, but as care practitioners, there's a duty of care to make sure that what you're selling is correct, that it's safe. And that's the line that sometimes get blurred. You've got people coming through who 
the information they're using to try and sell it, it's just not appropriate like they're making promises that you know don't really exist or they, they shouldn't be doing um so yeah i hope, I hope that is it that's a bit of a bit of a no 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 that. it is i think we might be no. dropping out a little bit yeah, no, no, I agree with you. I think it is. It's having you've got to have belief in what you're saying for one. Like that, that's that's critical. If you don't believe in what you're saying, you you then it's not going to help the client. And you, ultimately, that's what you're there to do. It's also getting the balance between if you have got something that you think works that is going to mean more sessions, more money, whatever it may be. You have got a duty of care to explain that to them, and then it ultimately is their choice, isn't it, to be able to to say whether they want to do it. And as long as you yeah. believe in what you're saying and you've got their best interests, then I, I think yeah. it's, it's it's just that. But that again, I really think that's the case in in most things that you're doing. Is uh, as you yeah. say, you, you you need to make money, or else you're not going to be there to yeah. be able to offer these services. Yeah. My personal ethos with it is, if you have a great service. And, and that could be with certain products that can boost your revenue and things. So, you know, if you've got shockwave packages and things like that as well, or extra rehab or anything, that's fine. But if you've got a great service and a great package and you deliver that to people well, they're going to then spread that word out and you're naturally going to grow anyway, is very much my opinion. Um, when people go too much into their sales, it can nearly even look desperate. And it's like, I'm starting to think, well, actually, what is the quality of, that you are doing. If you need to sell this hard to get people in, you're probably not having the return of clients that you should be. Because um, that's I mean, like, yeah, if, if you've got a good product and a good model and everything, in my opinion, there should naturally just be a level of return clients coming through and word of mouth referrals coming out that even if it's just to maintain, you should be there. So people that are selling too much definitely starts to make you wonder what's actually happening in the background there. Um, from just either quality of product or just desperation of price um you know is their business model actually sustainable yeah. yeah yeah no 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 i agree i agree on that and that's why when you see these things on social media popping up we guarantee you 30 new clients you kind of like oh yeah those marketing people who are coming in with that stuff as well with the new patients it's one i've got no idea how 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 they're getting those people in or two, what's the quality of that person? Um, I don't understand how those marketing people are making those sorts of claims. And um, this has actually been a really interesting thing that we've seen in Australia, and I don't know about it here. I was talking with my lawyer friend last night at dinner, um, where a lot of allied health professionals in Australia, because we have such stricter protocols, are getting basically sued online and getting in help in trouble with APRA, which is our national body, our HCPC, getting in trouble for comments and things that they're saying on any form of social media, if it's not actually scientifically backable. And then so, yeah, a, a client might have charged them with a false claim or something, takes it to APRA, that person sending in trouble is like actually through their social media, you have to delete X, Y, Z, you can't say this. And there are then obviously financial repercussions that are happening with some of them um, if they've been properly sued for it as well versus just a complaint. And so I think a lot of people just from the like health practitioner side of it as well, and that side need to be very aware of what they're actually staying on this and any promises that they're making with these sort of rehab packages or, yeah, I'll fix your pain within five weeks, five sessions, blah, 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 because we could easily start seeing an uptick of people doing that here where HCPC actually start backing down and getting their lawyers involved and um, start getting those people in trouble. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, any of those claims, I think it's just like, yeah, you, you could delve into all of it. But I, I think it, I agree with you. The desperation piece is just like, well, what you're, you're really selling something that you can never promise anyway. Like, how do you know what? Well, they've got but anyway that's that's a whole other topic that we yeah. could uh, yeah. we could delve <laughs> we into back to you anyway back to you so yeah so how did you end up coming to the uk um it was actually the smallest little thing ever from one of my friends from uni um so she had done a gap year over here uh for a year um came back did some work like and we went to uni and her goal was always to kind of come back to the uk and uh basically came up to her one day, Liam, she's like trying to convince me to come over. And she said, if you come, we'll have a like a white Christmas. We'll be able to go see snow and have a proper white Christmas. 
And literally that was the one thing that was like, sick, I'm in. <laughs> That's what got it tipped me over the edge. But um, from my university, like I, being a little country kid, stayed on campus in one of the residential halls. And um, there's a bit more of a, like, I guess a hall culture there in Australia than what we have here, where like I stayed for three years. Um, and there were, how many? 5,000 students like living on campus at that point. So when I moved over, I already knew easily over a hundred people from my university that had done the same kind of ride of passage where you work for one or two years in Australia, as I say, do that grad program, get your training. And these are people from any field, not just physios, but we then moved to UK on um, like a skilled worker visa and we're here for two years. So they've now just opted to three years, but because we're so far away from Europe and the rest of the world, like for us to be able to live here and basically travel Europe, and this is where budgie smother Liam comes in. <laughs> um, it, it's just such an incredible opportunity and it's really easy for us to get work here that it's like, why would we not do it? Like it, it feels like you're a fool to not actually come over. So from the 11 people that was in my close friendship group studying with at uni, nine of us moved over and were living together at the same, like here across it, like the one period of time. So um, very much an easy thing for me to be able to do, to come over and do that. Um, there's only actually two of us here now, but yeah, it just got to a point where I, I was having fun, enjoying the opportunities and I basically get to winter and say, okay, I'll do one more year. I'll go home next September. And then summer comes and I have so much fun and I've got to do the call to mum again and be like, I'm really sorry, but it'll be another year again. <laughs> so I, I think she's given up asking the poor woman um, on when I'll be home. Um, but it is definitely that annual yearly cycle as well that's keeping me here. So summer, super fun, gets to winter, gets to January, and me miserable and like, okay, final year, final year. <laughs> And then, yeah, the sun comes back out again and, and you got me hooked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so did you get to, you must have had a white Christmas in that time then. Um, yes, yeah, so the first first Christmas that um, we had over here, that's to mean there was a bunch of us though. We went over to France and hired like a chalet, catered one and went skiing for a week and stuff. So um, luckily I was actually with my physio friends. This is an embarrassing story, but tore my hamstring Christmas Eve night. Um and then so I had to go skiing Christmas Day with a big old torn hammy, which was not the most pleasant of things to be doing. <laughs> um, but I managed to get myself through and get some free treatment from the rest of the world, which is quite nice. Um, but I've actually only had like the one, I guess, white Christmas over in Europe, had a few Christmases here. But it's now the point where, yeah, winters are dark. So I, I fly back home in mid-December and spend a month or so back in the sun and then come back mid-January semi ready to to face the darkness for a little bit yeah and where were you guys living then when you the nine of you oh so we weren't like purely living together but like at one time we were all in london um right. i used used to be a little west boy um like everyone was like classic little Cla clapping going to in in no, shepherd's every bush, week. mate shepherd's bush okay yes yeah, so you got uh what's it called white um white fields to walk about um, yeah. Oh, so the yeah, walkabout. God, the yeah. Out there, but walkabout, come on, mate. So that that was the Aussie stick. So I was uh, mincing around kind of Shepherd's Bush uh, and Fulham for a few years. Um, but now I actually live up in Angel. So little kind of east north boy, um, but still in central London, which is, yeah, really quite nice. Yeah, it's quite hipster, isn't it, uh, around that north north space? It was at the, the Arsenal event recently. And it's, uh, but it's, yeah, it's cool, isn't it? I mean, London's, I love going to London. I've, been going for years it's obviously really easy for me to get there but every time I go I just think it's such an incredible place to be yeah um, I was having dinner with my friend from uni that's still here last week and even now like we've, we've both been here a decade and every now and again we, we still take a step back and be like holy excuse my French but like holy shit like we, we live in London like this is so cool because that's like yeah growing up you see it on the movies and I guess that's one of the weirdest things to happen when we move here. We, we've grown up seeing so much of it in, in, you know, culture, pop culture and films and stuff that when you come over here and you get to see it first day and you're like, oh, like, this stuff's actually real. Um, so even now still, yeah, you get that little sense of this is pretty awesome. 
Yeah. So what, where were you working then? What, what job did you move into when you were over here? Um, so just started with uh, like NHS outpatients as a locum when I first moved over. So did that out in um, West Middlesex for a few months, worked at, uh, oh, I forget the name, a neuro hospital in neuro rehab, which was very interesting. Um, but I developed or learned how to speak Arabic. So that was quite fun. Got a translation sheet on day one. So going home and telling mum that I can now speak Arabic was very interesting she did not expect that to be the language that i could come back and speak <laughs> but even now if i'm a little bit tired so the arabic still pops out in, in physio <laughs> sessions which really throws people off um but yeah just did locum work for a year and then that's where i needed to kind of find a job to be sponsored to stay here which is the kind of visa process that we all go through and then so went to yeah work at 10 health and fitness and so was there for nearly six years by the time I kind of got all my visa process and everything done, got my indefinite leave to remain. And at that point I could kind of do whatever work I wanted to. And so that's when I started up Inspire, went out on my own and have just been building that for the last two and a half years now. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, really good. I know that 10, there was loads of Aussie physios like Shane, wasn't it? Shane was there for a long time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so like for the, like when when you started to move out on your own, like at what point did you start to think that you wanted to do your own thing? So when I was leaving 10, um, I was actually interviewing with another private practice to go uh, and work for them just because there was a slightly better opportunity with them. Um, but at that point, uh, I actually got offered the contract with British Weightlifting and then so the chance to move into professional sport. And that's when it was like, oh, I don't know how I'm going to juggle or we couldn't work out with that other employer, like how I'd be able to work in professional sport and have time away for these big trips and then still be able to kind of work in private practice and make sure that, you know, I'm getting generating enough revenue to, to balance salary with them. Um, and so until basically stepped in at that point and it literally just happened by fate. Um, the operations manager here, I used to work with at 10, and he basically uh, approached me. Uh, they came over and was like, we're looking for a head, like of the whole treat side of it. We want someone that can kind of build up the reputation, get good people in, train people up uh, and look after that whole area. And he knows, given that we work together, kind of what I was doing at 10. Um, and so put me forward for it. And then so, that basically presented me the opportunity to, to start my own thing, have that flexible working environment and still be able to work in professional sport. And that's basically just where I came from, like um, the want to kind of combine that. So I'm really actually grateful for, for Jared and until for stepping in at that point and presenting that as an option. Um, so yeah, Inspire got born from there. So I used to work kind of three to four days here in my own. And then I do a, a day a week with British weightlifting as well. And so that was a two year contract to have finished up with that now. And I guess Inspire is big enough that it kind of demands that I need to be here kind of full time to look after it. So yeah, just trying to build up the Inspire empire now. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that is sometimes things do just work out, don't they? It's like, you, you're not quite sure yeah. how it happens, but it's like, God, this is just, I, I really believe in that, that, that kind of the, the secret law of attraction, whatever you want to say. Um, but it does yeah. tend to happen if you're doing, you feel like you're doing the right things, it's good things tend to happen. And that's literally how it happened. So even with the job, which like a uh, 10, so Shane, as you mentioned, so someone did an introduction, I went and met him within about 20 minutes, had a job offer, didn't think about it too much, said yes, continued through with them. And then yeah, just by luck, Jared came through there. So very grateful for the level of luck. I think that they've had, a uh, through my career to kind of fall into pretty incredible roles and be surrounded by good people and to me I guess my goal now is actually pay that back like um, I'm so grateful for what those guys did to me in terms of training and development and support that my goal now with my team is give that back just as much if not more than what I did and, and really be that role model that I had you know in those fledgling years yeah how how do you do that? How do you do that payback? Um, well, I love to teach. So like all through my life, like I taught swimming, um, I taught athletics. So 
teaching for me is really second nature and really what I love doing and would you know happily actually go back to uni and try and teach there and stuff so uh, I just try and spend I guess as much time as I can one-to-one with the employees and work out like a bespoke program for you it's we sit down and go where do you want to be in five years what are the strengths you think you have where are your weaknesses and we just create a tailored plan about what their goals are what i think the gaps in their knowledge are or things that i could pass on to them that they probably don't have yet and we basically just sit there and then each week just work through that catalog and try and build them up as much as possible yeah yeah no i think it's a really good philosophy to have isn't it like giving and it's it definitely rewards and obviously if you invested in your team as well it's going to build your brand yeah. and and, and make that good so like in terms of the weightlifting like what's what's it like working with those because they must be some absolute beasts of people with just their quite a unique skill set oh very much so like they're easily some of the most powerful athletes in general um and then so uh, like they're that strong that if i trained with them i would train with the lightest girl at 49 kilos and she could probably on some of them actually lift more than me <laughs> which was quite embarrassing um but no, working with them is like one really fun because as a sport they are just really relaxed chilled people um there's a really defined line which i guess in other sports can be really great in terms of injury are they competing are they not these guys you know are putting so much weight above their head if they're not prepared for it they're out so th- th- the, I guess the stress of my job from that point of view was quite easy. People would just be like, look, I'm really sorry, but it's not safe. So we can pull them. Um, but trying to develop, I guess, that high level power was for such technical moves, um, really challenging as well. So if you think like most athletes or people that we see in clinic, they're just coming in and, you know, they get a bit sore bending over to the dishwasher or something and it's body weight. These guys are back squatting 200 kilos or deadlifting 250 and they're throwing 150 kilo snatch above their heads or they even a hundred kilo snatch above their head. So the level of strength and tissue capacity they need was so far beyond any kind of recreational athlete that we've ever faced before. So it's like, it really challenged exercise prescription and working with the SNC coaches and just the coaches from a technique point of view as well. And we really had to work together to make sure that everyone was on point, that we were all doing the same thing. And then so that, you know, I wasn't limiting the SNC program too much, or, or maybe I would have to put my foot down and be like, look, at this point, they just can't do it. I understand, you know, you think they can, they can move but from a tissue healing point of view no or go to then coaches and be like well actually these muscles are really weak what can we do from a technique point of view to actually develop them in there so really challenged but developed my kind of mdt working with those guys um and definitely feel like a much better physio for it now um so basically all the clients that i have in now where you know, you go and reach for the one or two kilo dumbbell. Sometimes it's one of them, and I'm like, "This is not going to do shit." Like, why the hell am I doing that? I'm like, "No, pick up more, pick up more." And e- even my physios will sit there and be like, "Lee, I'm like, you're giving your clients a lot of weight there." I'm like, "Yeah, but they can move it." Like, sometimes they actually need the confidence of us to sit there and have confidence in them that yes, you can push the weight. Like, give them that freedom instead of. I do think when we reach for small weights, we, we limit our patients in some capacity. And then so seeing what these guys can actually do is definitely allowed me with my other clients to be like, well, actually, if they could push a little bit more and had tissue capacity, if I think you've got capacity, let's do it. Push the heavier weight. Yeah. No, I think it's that's really interesting to see see what you carry over from it, because you're dealing with the absolute elite, but the body can do yep. incredible things. And it's sometimes it is a mind thing as well, isn't it? If, of how you cope with stuff yeah big time um because we did, did actually have a few athletes where you go into a mental block where you know if you're for those aren't really familiar with the snatch it's basically a barbell on the floor throwing it above your head in one go locking elbows out at the bottom of a squat is where you catch it if you have any doubt in your mind that you're 
are not going to be able to stabilize that weight, it's not going to bug your head at all. So they really have to have that mental confidence side of it. So uh, the words that we used with them around any injuries or problems and stuff was really key in managing any of those back, like back to full performance and just making sure that they know that we had confidence that their tissue was going to hold up so that they could kind of really lock out and and put that full force into it yeah yeah no, yeah like the words like did you do any other like nlp training or other stuff like other things to help you with communication because it's such a massive thing again it's like trying to support them physically with not getting injured but also how you encouraging uh, motivating all of that side like do you, do you do any other stuff around that i've never like done extra training personally um i just think again luckily it's just a skill that i've kind of got whether it is through years of sport in the background and having good coaches or being around some of those other physios and absorbing what they've been doing um it just seems to be a bit of a natural skill set i've got and bit of a motherly instinct at times as well on really being able to just support them from emotional capacity like even outside of the performance side of it sometimes you've got a human like in front of you and I think a lot of people forget that and are still trying to treat an injury but you've got a human in front of you who's upset and scared and stuff so it's like I hug my patients all the time we might sit there and just have a conversation for 30 minutes and be like I, like I understand you're in pain, but I think your pain's from this. We need to address this right now. If I don't have the skill set to address it, we will converse about who they're going to go see to get that help. And I will like really push them down that avenue and make sure they're getting all those extra support things that they have. And yeah, again, I think that's actually just a natural skill that I've got. And I know that I've tried to get some other staff members and stuff to do it previously who just don't have confidence in it. And if you are one of those people out there who doesn't have confidence, have a conversation, is working out what are you comfortable saying and just making sure that you push that person to someone who is confident to kind of have that conversation with them and, and have those extra support people in place. So psych, nutrition, counselling, anything like that, even just like if it's sports performance for a high level person, actually recruit those people in and use much more of a team instead of just having you trying to have the conversation or not being comfortable so not having the conversation ever and then you just got the elephant in the room every single time and it's like okay you know someone's problems pretty much are coming from the anxiety or the depression or they're obsessed with exercise because that's transferred over from a previous eating disorder if you don't address that you can give them the world's best rehab program in the world but you're probably not going to fix it realistically let's be real like i honestly think we need to start having those conversations with people and being a bit more real to actually get to the true cause of what their problems might be if we really want to actually yeah like fix and get people better yeah no i couldn't agree more really i think that mental aspect and it is it's like that coaching counseling cbt there's always there's, there's not people don't like talking about a lot of that over here but it's i think oh, it's massive you that, that's probably why i'm comfortable british people that can just see them freeze up and just as an aussie we're so upfront and blunt i'm like i'm just going to put this out there we need to talk about this and like sometimes they'll freeze up and it's like okay cool that's a non-starter say we're not going there but i think with me being so open just willing to have that conversation with them actually does allow them to be like okay cool like walls come down here's the information this is what's actually going on yeah no no i think it's a really is important message that it's i think it severely is lacking in a lot of it and that for whatever reason but that's something which i find i, I yeah i'd love to support with like development or things around this or getting not that i've got the answers but of sharing ideas and getting people to be more open and confident in what they're doing because i just think it's it can help a load more people and a lot of the stuff maybe isn't physical it's there's a lot of other things going on big time yeah yeah but again, like we get no training in a university. So unless you have some kind of personal development or issues that mean you've learned that skill over time or someone's taught it to you, like we're not being taught that a uni in any capacity. You really need to be going out and kind of seeking development in that area yourself or just be lucky and have a natural skill set there to do it. So I do think, yeah, whether it's university programs or postgrad training or something, we definitely need 
better training and having those harder conversations because no medical medical staff do it so there's no reason why that same sort of procedure can't be applied into any kind of allied health yeah no definitely definitely because it's very physical sciencey and sometimes that's the opposite of, of what is needed in that in that first instance or any instance yeah. Yeah, well, we talk about the biosocial, so, biopsychosocial model, but at uni you're just getting taught like bio, and they mention the other two, but you don't get trained in it that much. So it's like, well, actually, you know, they're espousing one thing, but they're not really teaching it. Definitely, yeah. No, I think it's a really is a really interesting topic. So, like for you, it's your culture for your business. Then, like, what what are you recruiting for? We're going through values and things. We're always like assessing those things. But like, what when you're recruiting? How do you do? You have like mission statements, values. How, how do you how do you benchmark what the, what the vibe of Inspire is? Yeah, um, there is yeah like a, a motto and everything there and some core values, but. I guess what I'm recruiting is I want a human that I can talk to. They can easily sit there and have a conversation with me that um, kind of understands exactly what I just said, that there's a role, but sometimes you're going to have to operate well outside of that. So someone who's really well-rounded just as a person is much more what I'm looking for. I can train pretty much anyone to be a good physio if I've got enough time with them, it is my opinion. So... I am looking for a good physio, but I need that good person who's going to be able to step into the role that regardless of the person that walks in in front of them, whatever kind of emotional or mental state they're in, they're going to be able to cope with that situation. Um, but even then, just from the level of professionalism, and this is one thing I'm really big on um, outside of Bodges Fuck the World, <laughs> is I want to make sure that if I put you in front of my colleagues, in front of other sports consultants or, or anything like that, professional athletes, you've got the confidence to kind of stand there and be able to have that conversation and be able to interact in that world with people. So yeah, professionalism, confidence, self-awareness, they're probably some of the big things I'm looking for, even before I actually consider their, their actual skill level. Yeah. Well, no, I was going to ask you for your advice for people getting into the industry. I think those skill sets is helpful. Is, is there anything else that you would, you would recommend for people that are wanting to get into, into this area? Uh, so into like private practice uh, yeah private practice even just getting into healthcare and like just 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 yeah whatever, whatever the space is of, of physical rehab yeah um n- number one you do have to have the clinical skill to, to know your stuff so having a drive to always self-improve and, and make sure you're aware that you're never going to be the smartest person in the room and you don't want to be the smartest person in the room really so you're a continual learner you have to have that like or skill set but once you've got that knowledge it's being able to step back and realize that actually you need to look holistically at that person and start to think not what like is causing like that where their symptoms are right now but what's actually caused that like what's the why in the background and how can you actually start modifying that so we make real life change in that person's life versus just symptom management that to me is one of the big things that I think people need to to start looking at. Yeah, great. No, no, I think it's just really interesting. Is it's really good getting your perspective from Australia and from that sporting background because I didn't know that much about that the Australian pathway on things. So it's I think it does explain a lot about why you guys are really revered in a lot of different areas. Um, and it's great to have so many over here and, and you don't come up north as much, which maybe you need to, but it is a little bit, it's a few degrees colder. So maybe that's <laughs> it's the too problem. Cold, mate. <laughs> <laughs> like you might get some Melbourneites will come up that way, but us Queenslanders, I, I'm sorry about it. I need that sun. I live as close as I can to the airport so I can get off to <laughs> Europe in the sunshine. <laughs> yeah. Well, on the subject, so I, I spent a one Christmas in Melbourne and everyone's like, oh, it's going to be grazing. It was like, it's freezing. It was like, what's going on? It wasn't even that warm. It's like, this is really weird. It wasn't, it was quite disappointing, quite frankly. Yeah. So, no, you need to come up to the north where it'll be 40 degrees, humidity at 90%, and you're absolutely roasting, sweating your ass off. Um, that's a true Aussie Christmas. Yeah, next time we'll do that. Well, Liam, thank you for sharing. Really appreciate it and uh, enjoyed it. And I look forward to, to more photos on social media. So, good man. I'm in Barcelona next week, so get ready for the content, buddy. Can't wait. Um, but 
thank you so much for having me on. It's yeah, been an absolute pleasure and always happy to help out with the team. Cheers, Liam. Thanks, mate. Bye-bye. Right. Take care, mate.